Well, let's get going with our, our censored information that we're not allowed to present at the Left Forum, <laughs> beginning with this wonderful topic of censorship. Uh, <laughs> uh, political correctness, the dangers of the thought crime police. Well, we've, uh, we've had a run in with the thought crime police, and uh, here we are, we've survived it. Uh, so let's introduce our panel here. Um, I'm Dr. Kevin Barrett, and I'll be back for future panels, and somebody else can introduce me. Uh, I'm a banned academician, uh, run out of the University of Wisconsin for talking about 9-11, and you'll hear more about that later. But our, our two main panelists this, for this particular panel are Jeremy Roth Cushell and Professor Anthony Hall. Let's start out with Jeremy. Jeremy Roth Cushell is uh, well, he's, he's got a broad background in politics, uh, from local to international, office holder to activist, uh, experience in media jamming, guerrilla journalism, consensus building in deep politics, economics, and ecologics. He's working on a documentary called September 11th Uncoverage, based on a decade of research into the 9-11 cover-up. He's also uh, produced and performed hip-hop and future roots music for more than two decades. So take it away, Jeremy Roth Cushell. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin Dr. Barrett, for, for uh, introducing us. And thank you so much to all of the organizers and uh, Humuk and Alan Rees at No Lies Radio for pulling all of this together and for all the support team. Um, I just want to just uh, give a shout out to all of us who came together here to honor the best of all of our wisdom traditions, whether religious or secular, that the best way to handle our differences and to seek uh, communion with uh, knowledge is to get together and uh, talk. So here we are, the dialogical approach. Uh, so um, I'm gonna be presenting about uh, something that happened to me about, in, about a year ago, uh, almost exactly a year ago, last May. Uh, where I was arrested at the Kansas City Public Library at a uh, public event um, open to the public. In fact, the, the attorney of, the, uh, of Kansas City, the city prosecutor at that point, uh, Lowell Gard, when he was looking for video evidence from the library uh, in terms of these charges, he said that this, these uh, recordings depict quote, depict events which occurred in a public place at an event open to the public. The concept of uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is I believe what happened at the library was the Palestinification of the, of the entirety of the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. And I believe that it's an indicator of what is coming in increasing fashion if we are not courageous enough to step into these difficult spaces and protect the very first uh, amendment of the constitution as the executive director of the kansas city public library system crosby kemper the third uh, called it and i believe that's true the first amendment is first because it's most important in many ways because if we don't if we don't have the ability to have our own thoughts our own beliefs our own commitments religious commitments, we can't speak, we can't assemble, we can't record and broadcast our message to other people, then w what are we going to create? So here's uh, was the announcement. It was just in the Kansas City Public Library's, uh, uh, their website. It was, uh, this is how I found out about the event. I then RSVP'd to the event, to the library under my name. Um, and then I went and met a friend, uh, Greg McCarran from Kansas City there, um, who uh, I do a weekly radio show called Antidote Radio on No Lies every week. And it's because Greg was there and courageous with me that we actually have the press, the, the documentary coverage of what actually happened rather than um, uh, erroneous accounts. Um, so. So May 9th, 2016, uh, Dennis Ross, the former ambassador from the United States to Israel, was presenting a lecture called Truman in Israel. It was co-presented, uh, 
They're co-sponsored by the Jewish Community Foundation of Kansas City and the Truman Library Institute, um, which is a semi-private, uh, semi semi-federal organization linked to the presidential library systems. And uh, yes, next slide. So we're going to play the video now of uh, what actually happened so we can all be on the same page together. Uh, so this is not just uh, hearsay. Um, so it, here's, the, here's the video that Greg took on my camera from the side. And then this is the actual official recording of the library that has not been publicly released yet. So I'm going to take some questions. I think there are mics. You can come up to the mics. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, I'm very interested in the issue of tribalism and terror. Just today, I ran into an article referencing uh, Truman's daughter and Margaret's book, uh, disclosing that the um, that um, the uh, Stern gang uh, sent mail bombs to Truman uh, in 47. And we know that when, when I think, I don't know, I can't remember which group blew up the King David Hotel, but Jews were uh, amongst the dead uh, involved in that necessary state craft that ultimately became that. So you see this long history of, of not only the United States, but Israel utilizing uh, terrorism that includes potentially the death of its own tribe to advance its own uh, geopolitical cause all the way up into the 21st century, including September 11th and that whole mess that I would tell people to look at uh, Alan Zabrowski, the Jewish uh, courageous Marine who's exposed the Zionist role in that. So I would ask you, at what point does the Jewish diaspora, do we have to have the ethical courage, I'm a Jewish American, to point out that, especially in America, both the countries that operate in our name have used terrorism way too long including against its own citizens to uh, project power at home and abroad. When are we going to stand up and be ethical Jews and Americans? So, I don't think that as a matter of policy that the United States or Israel engage in acts of terror. You know, the terror is you target deliberately civilians for an express political purpose. You know, the idea that Israel has something to do with 9-11 is, is just outrageous. They had nothing to do with it. Tell that to the Marine. Tell that to the Marine, Alan Sabrowski. Look at my Jewish American Marine. You, know, you can make up whatever you want to. I'm a big believer, well, I'm a big believer, as Patrick, Dan Patrick Moynihan used to say, everybody's entitled to their own opinions, they're just not entitled to their own facts. Is there anything, and what would it be, that Americans that are taxpayers can do to influence the United States at the United States? Okay. okay. So that's, that's what happened. We then, uh, and actually the, the person intervening there, uh, um, not the, the person who grabbed me um, was a, the head security officer of the Jewish Community Foundation, actually the Jewish Community Center of Kansas City, uh, a man named Blair Hawkins, who I'll talk more about later. Um, then an off-duty Kansas City detective named Brent, Brent Parsons, who was the liaison from the Kansas City Police Department to the Department of Homeland Security's local fusion center, jumped in. At that point, the, the librarian who had helped organize the event, uh, and had, we have the email showing how much effort the library had been put in, put in not being paid to help make this event go well, a man named Stephen Woolfolk, who has since gotten uh, 
awards from uh, national library organizations, even the children's author Lemony uh, Snicket, I think his name is, has given uh, Steve an award for his actions here. Steve intervened in a non-physical way to tell them that the rules of the, of the venue that they were allowed to be in was that speech was allowed and that they were not to be, we can handle this without force, okay? So this, uh, what happened after the, that the video gets cut off would be uh, uh, maybe a presentation for a day where we're not focused so much on the First Amendment, but focus more on the Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendments. But needless to say, both Steve and I were arrested by, uh, by off-duty police officers of the Kansas City Police Department who were being uh, contracted with, apparent, apparently by both the Jewish Community Foundation and the Truman Library Institute that evening, and were only allowed into the library by the permission of the, of the Kansas City Public Library and people like Stephen Woolfolk himself. So the library employee also got arrested for letting the, the private security know the rules. Um, so here's the uh, arrest uh, record. Um, I was charged with trespassing um, and then resisting or interfering. I think it's maybe actually an obstructed, obstruction charge of some sort. Uh, it, it shows that my I'm not of Hispanic or Latino. I am. I'm a Jewish Mexican. And actually, you'll see that identity is intensely at play here and controversial. And there's a lot of denial of my identity. Um, it says I'm angry. Later on, we'll see another report. I was, I was angry at that point. At that point, I was Just angry. Yeah, all right. So I was. I was. You can tell I was angry about being grabbed from behind by an unidentified man in a suit for engaging in very core political speech that we needed to be talking about. But the, as we'll talk about later, the, there was another off-duty, uh, um, actually a sergeant, who, who searched us on the way in. He was in uniform. His uh, report of, of these happenings is fairly accurate, and he reports that Greg and I, after I questioned him about why he wanted to search us, that we were friendly and cooperative, I think his words were. Um, so there's a disparity when, when you're treated with respect and then when you're treated with disrespect. Uh, okay. So here's the, here's the question that I asked, and I just want to briefly talk about what the, na the nature of my question was. It was, when I found out about this uh, event, I was researching Truman's history. And this was, this was being done in anniversary of the founding of Israel and Truman as the, the US president who first recognized Israel. And so this was a very uh, big merger in many ways, uh, maybe the import of which I didn't quite understand the intensity of the situation that maybe I was stepping into. I've been to many library events in Los Angeles. Um, the closest I've ever been to be, even being asked to leave is at a Christopher Hitchens event when he started throwing his insults around and I didn't allow him to get away with it. But I was never touched in a library. I didn't even think about that. So the first, the first thing that I brought up was this, uh, these letter bombs that had been sent by the Stern gang, by Lehi, uh, to Truman's White House in the summer of 47, I believe. Uh, it was actually a follow-up to the, they'd sent mail bombs to Brit British official, officials. Uh, more than a handful of British officials had received mail bombs. Um, this is sort of, there's another story also about a local Kansas City Jewish businessman who um, uh, who Truman had uh, interactions with and maybe even a business relationship with Eddie Jacobson uh, and there is a history about uh, money a briefcase of money uh, and an introduction to Chaim Weitzman I believe and and so yeah, I think there's that phrase the silver or the lead or you know the plato or plata or something like that <laughs> a pluma, right uh, and uh, so I think that's that's what this was. This was this was the hard line uh, approach. You know, do you guys want the mail bombs? Do you want the money? What are we gonna do here? This is a gangster operation of some sort. Um, so I thought it was really interesting, and the information that where that came from, I never heard of that. That came from Truman's daughter's book, Margaret's book. There was actually a, a, a head, I think, of the mailroom maybe 
of the post of the White House Postal Service who also mentioned it uh, at some point. The second thing I brought up was the King David Hotel bombing. The King David Hotel bombing is maybe the originator of modern terrorism in many ways. And people who were involved in that have actually bragged about it. They were not only the originators of, uh, of uh, you know, of uh, terrorism in the Middle East, but uh, they were the originators of terrorism in the world. Um, Menachem, the, Begin. Menachem Begin. Okay, thank you. And uh, and so the that the previous write up of the of the Stern Gang letter bombs to Truman, I believe, is now the. Uh, the most extensive record that I've been able to find on the internet about that. So this incident's already generated uh, some journalism and some research about that. That was uh, Richard Silverstein's blog, Takuno Olam. Um, okay, so then the Lavon affair. This is what I did not bring up, but was in the is in the background and very resonant with what happened. The Lavon affair uh, that was sort of pinned on uh, Lavon was actually called Operation Susanna, and that was driven primarily by uh, Israeli military intelligence with other intelligence services involved, using Jewish assets in Egypt to target uh, British and American installations, including libraries. They're gonna firebomb libraries and then blame it, and then, uh, you know, and blame it on other people. So here's a picture of folks who are in the mix there, Moshe Dayan, Shimon Perez in the background, and then Levon, there he is. And Perez was actually gave the video introduction to the event that evening at the Kansas City Public Library. We're going longer than that, I think. Right, this is your time. No, oh, I, 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 I that's what I was indicated to do. There's only two speakers. Yeah, there's only two, two speakers, hours. so we're, yeah, yeah. We'll, 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 thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, video message from Israel in the beginning of that event. And he's a very important character, and if I'd sort of done a little more research before the event and known that he was going to be uh, the video messenger, then I might have uh, included some of the aspects of his involvement. Perez is the godfather of the Israeli nuclear program. Uh, he was, I believe he was the handler of uh, Arnon Milshan, the uh, Hollywood executive and Israeli uh, nuclear intelligence agent of some sort who produced uh, the film JFK by Oliver Stone. Makes you wonder what was not in that film. Um, so here is a picture of uh, Brent Parsons. This is the off-duty detective, uh, the Kansas City Police Department, who has actually made the official arrest that evening, even though he was off-duty being paid by private parties uh, it is in their handbook. They're allowed to uh, work off duty, but there are very clear operations. We found uh, that their guidelines for even a protest is that they have to be completely unbiased, non-politically motivated, very even-handed in how they're enforcing the law. They have to enforce the law. They're not allowed to enforce private policy or, you know, the big donors' desires. Okay, here's his background. Uh, in a, you can see he's involved in counterterrorism patrol strategies. Not only is he a liaison to the local fusion center in Kansas City, but he was also uh, part of a Homeland Security uh, and SCAN, which we'll talk about a little bit later, Secure Community Network, which has been titled by, um, by the head of the Jewish Federations of North America as, quote, our Jewish Homeland Security. I'd never heard of it until all of this. Okay, he went to Israel with a co-trip with uh, SCAN and uh, DHS to learn how to, uh, I don't know. Okay, <laughs> this, this is now sort of what happened. This, the man who grabbed me was uh, Blair Hawkins. He was the executive director of security for the, uh, the, the Federation, the Jewish Federation in Kansas City. This is his grab, and so it wasn't, it wasn't just a sort of tap on the arm. It was, it was pretty severe. Um, and I think I was very so focused on responding to Dennis Ross that I sort of didn't feel him at first. And then I look around, I'm like, what are you doing? Get off of me. So this, although it's been portrayed in the press that he's sort of just some like uh, former cop from Seattle, you actually fi found his background and he, uh, it looks to me like he actually was guarding Karzai in Afghanistan post 9-11 and running counterterrorism operations for the State Department for a year. Uh, 
This led, then led me to look into State Department uh, security called Diplomatic Security Services. I never actually heard of it. It's actually, I believe, at the, at it comes out of the oldest intelligence uh, uh, arm of the United States government, actually. It was called the, uh, I forget, it was, uh, you should look it up. It's very interesting. So he, he comes out of this uh, relationship, it looks like, with SCAN, Secure Community Networks, that's a sort of, that's a nonprofit organization that links up security contractors tied into Zionist power networks and ties it right back into uh, Homeland Security. So there was a shooting uh, in, uh, in the Kansas City area in Overland Park, Kansas, actually over the border. Uh, the Kansas City Public Library is in Missouri, the Bushwhacker side. The Kansas side is the free state side, I would just point out, the ab abolitionist side. But this shooting that happened two years before, people should actually go look up uh, Dr. Barrett's article on this at the time. He did, wrote a very interesting article. Fraser Glenn Miller, Glenn Miller, Glenn Fraser. he's got tons of names. Uh, he was, an, at one point, he was an FBI informant. Uh, looks interesting. Uh, he had a, a close sort of uh, maybe a counter gang type of relationship, it looks like, with the Southern Poverty Law, uh, Law Center. After the uh, shooting, he said he was trying to kill as many Jews as possible. He didn't kill any Jews. He mistook Christians for Jews, and he killed three uh, Christians, apparently. And uh, the first person to be able to contact him was not any reporter, and apparently not even the police, but was the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center was able to ring up his wife. Interesting. Okay, so then we then we start researching about what is this scan? Uh, how a secret charity helps Jewish groups feel safe forward? Are they safe? Are they feeling safe? What's actually going? We're getting what, helpers. What's going on here? So the the the, the uh, then head of the local Jewish uh, Federation of Greater Kansas City, Todd Stetner. It's, I'm quoting the article, was skeptical of SCAN before 2014. He said that he had great relationships with local cops and saw no need for an outside group. That changed after a neo-Nazi named Fraser Glenn Miller killed three people at Jewish sites in Stetner's community in Kansas last April. Quote, he had connections to the Department of Homeland Security to all the federal resources, Stetner said, of Paul Goldenberg, SCAN's national director, who flew to Kansas City after the attack. He, quote, he set us up to meet all the right people. Okay. So as I mentioned before, SCAN, Secure Community Networks, uh, this, this uh, parallel homeland security operation, specifically uh, for the Jewish federations, this was uh, from the, uh, the General Assembly of the Jewish Federations of North America um, in right after the election last fall, actually. And uh, the, uh, the head of, of the organization, um, Jerry Silverman, the president uh, and CEO, uh, right before he talked about uh, SCAN, our Jewish Homeland Security, he referred to the insidious reach of BDS and how we're allowed to have differences, but some issues bring us all together in order to uh, push back against. So what is the Secure Community Network? It's been around for 10 years. I never heard of it. Uh, it was started by the Conference of Presidents of the United Jewish Communities and the American Jewish uh, Committee. They're the prime sort of meta contractor of the Jewish federations of North America. In my mind, I was thinking of looking at the General Assembly. Imagine if like the Nation of Islam said, this is our, you know, this is our uh, African American Muslim homeland security organization. Uh, and then they introduced the president of, of Iran to be their featured speaker, because that's who uh, Silverman introduced was Benjamin Netanyahu next. OK, so you can look on uh, the, uh, Stetner, uh, Todd Stetner, who had had this previously, he didn't think he needed this relationship with SCAN. He uh, mentioned Paul Goldenberg uh, as the head of SCAN. Paul Goldenberg is also the uh, president and CEO of Cardinal Point Strategies, which is a security uh, consultancy contractor. He's on the he's on the board of the Homeland Security Advisory Council, uh, and, along with people like Lee Hamilton sitting right underneath him. So that's interesting. The 9-11 uh, cover-up is sitting right there. Then there's Jane Harmon. She was a key figure in uh, presenting a panel back in 2008, I believe, that put Richard Gage, AIA of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth, uh, in between 
um, white supremacist organizations, uh, anti-gay organizations, uh, uh, jihadi organizations. That's so, and then and then they point out that Richard Gage is trying to radicalize Americans. Okay, and this was done by uh, 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 a combination of someone from the Rand Corporation and the Simon Wiesenthal Center. And I believe it was actually the man from the Simon Wiesenthal Center that present, presented Richard Gage AIA as a uh, scary radicalizer for domestic, uh, you know, threats. Um, that got us looking into some of the overlap between those boards, and the name that stuck out was Peter Lowy, the son of Frank Lowy, a Zionist uh, terrorist, freedom fighter, whatever area you come from, uh, who was involved from with the Trade Center uh, deal with Larry Silverstein, with uh, Ronald Lauder, with Louis Eisenberg from the then Port Authority, by and Louis Eisenberg's deputy. Uh, a uh, deputy that uh, at that point was a man named Michael Glasner, who turned out to be the deputy campaign director of the Trump campaign straight out of Southwest APAC. I confronted him in Kansas. He's actually from Kansas. Um, so then, what is this relationship with SCAN, Secure Community Networks, the, our, our, quote, Jewish homeland security? This is some type of security uh, relationship or an insecurity relationship, it sort of more looks like in a way. Uh, so there, we found out that there, in it, actually the day after, this is a very strange coincidence, the very day after that I was arrested in the library, there was a, uh, a press release by FST <coughs> Biometrics uh, how they were the selected as the preferred security vendor for North American based Jewish community cent centers. Okay. And uh, FST is, uh, it's named after uh, a former head of Israeli military intelligence. This is a, what they do is they develop software that tracks people while they're in motion, including the way that they move, including the way that their face looks. Uh, this is a, um, an example of what they're, what they're, the way they're talking about it. The man who started it, his name is General Aharon Zaevi Varkash, Farkash, and uh, its FST is based on Farkash. Farkash would visit the Erez checkpoint from Gaza into Israel, and he saw that the Palestinians were standing in the queue to enter Israel for four, five, or even six hours, explained uh, Melamed, who's a press spokesperson person for FSD. The reason was security. The military was trying to make sure that no one was passing through the checkpoint was a terrorist or on a watch list. So let's look at the board of FST. And what, every time that we saw these articles about FST in the Kansas perspective or the Kansas City perspective, it would always mention the shooting at the Overland Park uh, Jewish Community Center. So here's the board. Uh, the chairman of the board, Avi Naur, he you might know him from uh, Amdocs, I believe. Does it say that is he from uh, Amdocs? I believe he is from yeah. Amdocs. Yeah. So he was he headed up Amdocs. Amdocs is a key uh, Israeli-owned uh, communications system that's tied very much into the Israeli spying networks surrounding September 11th and more. There's the founder, the former. Uh, Major General of the uh, Military Intelligence, Amman. There's uh, Gary Fagel. He's actually a, sort of like a Swiss banker of sorts, uh, works in the aluminum industry before. And so he's sort of greeting the wheels. And then we have Ehud Barak, who not only was a prime minister, is not only a credibly accused, uh, at least after the fact, uh, perpetrator of 9-11 of myth, He's going on BBC the morning of and telling us what we needed to know that this was. This was going to be a global war on terror. It was going to be a long time. This was Bin Laden likely. American troops are going to be on the ground all over the world. But he's all, he was also a, he's a former head of Israeli military intelligence. Okay, so this is now who's been brought in to police or to identify people uh, operating at the very least at this point in all of our Jewish community spaces. Okay. Um, so, in wrapping up, uh, Noam Chomsky's book, 9-11, uh, it's, it's really a pamphlet, it's a combination of uh, talks that he, he gave right after September 11th. Um, the, I just want to, I was going to talk about more of this, but we don't really have time, but I want to point out that he, 
he was asked about long-term rights restrictions. He said, that's not a threat. Our institutions are solid. Um, he said, did, did they miss it? The, the questioner asked, did, they, did the intelligence services miss it? The connivance of the US intelligence services? Chomsky asserts, they didn't know. No one knew anything. I'm not that impressed with Echelon or any of these global surveillance technologies. They didn't know. And then uh, finally, Oh, he also makes the point that this was an opportunity, a window of opportunity for the Israelis to go in and smash the Palestinians. Good point, Chomsky. Yeah. What does that mean about the Israelis' potential uh, interest in this event? And then finally, and this will lead the way into Professor Hall's talk, he, uh, and especially this is quite relevant in terms of our, our uh, gathering here today, the very last paragraph of Chomsky's book, he says, of course, there will be those who demand silent obedience we expect that from the ultra right, and anyone with a little familiarity with history will expect it from some left intellectuals as well, perhaps in an even more virulent form. But it is important not to be intimidated by hysterical ranting and lies, and to keep as closely as one can to the course of truth and honesty and concern for the human consequences of what one does or fails to do. All truisms, but worth bearing in mind. Chomsky is ironically uh, correct here. Okay, I'm gonna, let, me, let me see if I can rush through and wrap this up in, uh, in a couple minutes. Just give me a couple minutes, and I'll wrap it up. Okay. So, I would point out how apropos this is to our current situation. Um, the left forum panels, this panel was obviously okay a, a little while ago, and then the thought police got involved. In terms of Chomsky, I would point people to a YouTube video on my YouTube channel uh, done by Professor Anthony Hall, with a response by Dr. Karen Barrett when they were in Lawrence, Kansas, staying with Laurie and I uh, at our house, probably about almost within a day or two of when the Joshua Goldberg false flag imagery was being planted by still unknown parties uh, on uh, Professor Hall's page, which sets forth the, uh, the witch hunt against him. It's titled Academic Complicity and Left Progressive Thought Control in the Global War of False Flag Terrorism. Very, very important lecture. And so finally, the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights, it protects our inherent rights, our natural rights. And I just wanna put in a plug for the nature of how important all of these rights are and how maybe uh, trivialized they are. Uh, we think about speech as the right to give your opinion or to let off steam. Or, no, speech is about this. When we begin to deliberate about the things that matter, the things that are uncomfortable, the things that are vital to our, our future together cooperatively, press, press is not about a media pass and working for corporate companies to have access. The Supreme Court has already recognized press as a, as a uh, personal right we are inherent uh, press people. Assembly, the gathering, the right to gather together, even if it's out in the corner here of the John Jay uh, College, as I point out, at least we're outside of the, uh, the uh, Kroll uh, lobby over there, the uh, head of the security company of the World Trade Center, right down the hallway from the uh, Trade Center Metal. And in fully wrapping up, last thing, last minute, I'm gonna uh, play, a clip of uh, this is just a draft clip of uh, of the of the documentary that I'm beginning to work on September 11th on coverage, describing my experience in covering the 9/11 cover-up. Um, there'll be more later. So, and this 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 uh, this is a basically uh, about my experience in talking to people of all different backgrounds about. Um, officials to the bottom, and it's one minute, it's only one minute, okay. There'll be seven more tonight in Afghanistan. Oh my God. If telling the truth marginalizes you, you can as you that. As you that loud mouth ass. I'll get a pencil from your cup. In your point, sir. Then that is the place to be. What are you gonna do when treason comes on record? After all, if enough people are willing to be marginalized, then before you know it. Thank you very much, and we respect you very much. And your question is very important. Yes. 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 Yes.
Thank you, Jeremy. That was fantastic. Um, well, we're going to segue into what Jeremy mentioned there towards the end, which is the case of Professor Anthony Hall of the University of Lethbridge. Um, Professor Hall, as you'll be hearing, is the victim of the most outrageous and atrocious smear against an academician that I've ever heard of. And I've heard of quite a few, including my own case. Uh, <laughs> Professor Hall is a tenured full professor of liberal education and globalization studies at the University of Lethbridge. Uh, he's worked there for 26 years in Alberta, Canada. Uh, he's, an, he's been an associate professor of Native American studies as well. He currently hosts uh, False Flag Weekly News along with me and occasionally Jeremy and, and other guests. He's the editor-in-chief of the American Herald Tribune. He's well known for his magisterial two book series, The Bowl with One Spoon and Earth into Property. And this is published by McGill's Queens University Press. Uh, and it includes a history of the 9-11 truth movement. In early October of 2016, Professor Hall was suspended in, via in violation of the protections of tenure and the terms of a, a faculty administration collective agreement. Without his knowledge, a provocateur, a still unknown provocateur, had planted a reprehensible anti-Semitic photo on Dr. Hall's Facebook page, which instigated calls for his removal and blatantly deceptive press coverage. Uh, in, his, in the notice of suspension, the president of the university awkwardly speculated that Dr. Hall might have violated the Alberta Human Rights Act because, quote, he inferred that Israelis, and hence Jewish individuals, were responsible for the attacks on the World Trade Center on September 11, 2001. Dr. Hall is challenging the university for reinstatement of his teaching position, and I have all hopes and expectations that, inshallah, he will prevail. Yay. So take it away, Anthony Hall. Hello. Uh... The Left Out Forums in New York. I'm virtually with you, and uh, I am uh, geared up to make a significant presentation. I prepared uh, this uh, uh, introduction here, essentially for maximum embarrassment to the University of Lethbridge, and I'm calling the presentation The Suspension of Academic Freedom at the University of Lethbridge, Some Reflections from Personal Experience with Thought uh, crime policing in the academy. And I'm calling myself, how do I title myself these days? I'm calling myself suspended and tenured full professor of liberal education and globalization studies at the University of Lethbridge. Now, what is tenure for if it's not to protect you from arbitrary actions, if perchance you offend a powerful political lobby, as I obviously did offend something called the Bene Brith Canada. Uh, so uh, the part of the whole array of issues that we'll be addressing is if tenure is abolished in our institutions of higher learning, then there really is no protections. Then uh, this uh, episode that I'm living through, I see as a kind of a effort to create a precedent of or powerful interest to take over political control of what goes on in universities. Now, uh, in the uh, introduction, I wanted to go into a little bit of depth with Joy Kariga and remind you that when this forum was being put together, the original panelist was Joy Kariga, Dr. Kariga, who was suspended and suddenly fi uh, su subsequently fired at Oberlin University College, and she had a presentation in mind where she wanted to look at the way black scholars deal with the 9-11 narrative, the BDS movement, boycott, divestments, and sanctions, uh, 
the role of Zionism and Zionist lobbies in the universities. I'm really disappointed not to hear her, but she obviously, Dr. Kriga, obviously sensed that the thought police cops were on our case, that you couldn't trust the left forum to provide a decent milieu for a respectful academic debate. That's absolutely tragic. She wanted to talk about black scholars and 9-11. Uh, that raises the role of Farrakhan in drawing attention to the role of Israel in 9-11. Uh, she uh, wanted to talk about issues of race in relationship to these issues. What does it say uh, about the organizers of the left forum event that they can't incorporate a up and coming rising uh, black scholar of rhetoric and composition in their proceedings is, uh, you know, what's going on here? I wanted to talk about Jeremy, uh, the fact that on August 26, which uh, we'll be talking about a lot in my prepared presentation, uh, this Facebook post was put on my page. Where was I at the time? I was visiting uh, Lori, uh, William, their son, and Jeremy Roth Cushell at their home, taking part in many events, including the production of False Flag Weekly News. Oh my goodness, when I saw the New York Review of Books covering the case of what happened in the Kansas City Library, that was very impressive to me. Recall that in 1967, it was uh, the New York Review of Books which carried uh, the essay of a rising young scholar called Noam Chomsky talking about the responsibility of public inst intellectuals and especially professors. And unfortunately, Noam Chomsky violated these principles in smearing so-called 9-11 truthers in treating this subject as a kind of no-go zone. And uh, here is uh, Oberlin College, uh, which has uh, put itself into public infamy. It has a history of uh, activism in the abolition movement before uh, the American Civil War. It's, it, it integrated women first into the student body. And uh, uh, what a unfortunate uh, situation it's created for itself by making uh, Joy Kariga a symbol of what uh, Oberlin now stands for, the uh, crackdown on academic freedom, on free speech, on uh, the necessity for truth tellers, those who are committed to uh, question important, powerful official narratives. Uh, they have sided with those who seek to crush such voices. Stephen Salita, uh, William I. Robinson, uh, Professor James Tracy, along with Joy uh, Kariga, Richard Falk has been shouted down, uh, you know, shouted down and, and in his academic presentations, the former human rights uh, investigator for the United Nations. Uh, and uh, we're in a terrible situation as uh, William I. Robinson relates in his new book that he edited, co-edited to edited, we will not be silenced the academic repression of Israel's critics. So here uh, is a, a cartoon of me. Uh, this might give you some sense of the, uh, of the way that uh, uh, various forces have been mobilized to uh, take me out of the University of Lethbridge and to uh, undermine my voice on false flag weekly news. The major condemnation I face is that I do false flag weekly news, which is accused of being anti-Jewish. I try to use the language of Israel first partisans, neocons, Likudnik Israel. Uh, I'm not interested in studying uh, some ethnicity and condemning a, an ethnic group. I'm looking at power and the way power is exercised in a very specific terms uh, by agencies, like for instance, the Project for the New American Century. And uh, so let's uh, uh, go now to the uh, prepared part of uh, my presentation here, uh, the, the writing. And so I, I just covered the first quarter and now I'm going to read a script. And as I read the script, I'll uh, go through the slides. 
So uh, into the essay, I came to the section, Contentions of Profound Importance for the Future of Higher Education. The core episode, maybe let's uh, uh, just, there's a bit of a, uh, a delay when I transfer here. The core episode in the effort to nuke my career and reputation occurred in early October of 2016. From one day to the next, I was pulled from my teaching responsibilities in midterm, summarily suspended, initially without pay. These punitive measures were imposed completely outside the terms of the collective agreement with the University of Lethbridge Faculty Association. And I had anticipated that taking part in the left forum, there would be a lot of university faculty, it's happening in a university, that these professional issues within the academy could be discussed with colleagues. Little did I know that colleagues would turn on uh, me who am trying to deal with the repression of free speech in universities. Uh, they were imposed by presidential dictate in the complete absence of any uh, due process. So let's go back to some of the images and uh, uh, here is a significant uh, letter from something called the Canadian Association of University Teachers. In his letter to me of October 3, University of Lethbridge President Dr. Mike Mon made vague references to some possible violations of the Alberta Human Rights Act that he speculated might have taken place. This possible contravention, I was informed, involved my quote, inferring that Israel and hence Jewish individuals were responsible for the terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center on September 11. Well, I think a lot of people were responsible for what happened, but who was the directing force? Uh, and uh, many roads and paths of research done by, for instance, Alan Sabrosky or uh, Richard uh, uh, Bolin uh, uh, and... Uh, you know, many others, including Kevin Barrett, demonstrate that the Israel first partisans, not only in Israel, but in the United States government, in many governments, a powerful lobby, had a disproportionately uh, intense, concentrated role in what happened on 9-11. Now, that is a pretty explicit description of a thought crime that some powerful interests apparently want to outlaw in the jurisprudence of the academy. Will we see in the future uh, the questioning of the official narrative of 9-11 become something like the questioning of the official narrative of the Shoah? Uh, all aspects of this subject are apparently perfectly handled, are no longer subject to any discussion, regardless of what new information comes in. We all know that this term Holocaust denier uh, was deployed uh, by Marcus Grech on the basis of a German organization's advice. That's how come I'm not in New York right now. I'm in uh, Lethbridge, Alberta, Canada. So let me continue. Since October, there have been many twists and turns in the matter of the suspension of academic freedom at the University of Lethbridge. Various professional associations have intervened in my defense including the 68,000 member strong Canadian Association of University Teachers. Is the left forum aware that they're going against the Canadian Association of University Teachers who is trying to defend me from the likes of co-directors uh, Marcus Grech and uh, Ashley Abbott who just come up with this a weaponized term and uh, shut a whole panel down based on that. In December of 2016, the delegates at a CAUT council meeting unanimously passed the resolution that Cout condemn the actions of the University of Lethbridge administration in suspending Professor Tony Hall without due process and that CAUT take all ne necessary measures to pressure the administration to immediately resolve the matter. Well, the matter isn't resolved. In the letter explaining the resolution of U of, uh, to U of L President Mike Mon, CAUT Executive Director David Robinson concluded, 
CAUT is taking this matter extremely seriously. We will be providing full support to the University of Lethbridge Faculty Association in pursuing all their legal options. If the matter is not resolved satisfactorily and in a timely way, we will be pursuing other options, including imposing censure on your administration for violations of due process, natural justice, and academic freedom and tenure rights. So here is uh, the statement of claim, and I'm just here on this podium announcing that I am suing the President, the Board of Governors, and Senate of the University of Lethbridge. Our statement of claim has been re uh, registered at the Judicial Center of Lethbridge in the Court of Queen's Bench of Alberta, file 1706-00300. The core of our case so far cites three public announcements to the university community written and disseminated widely by the U of L President and Vice Chancellor Mike Mon, PhD. These announcements were published on October 14, January 17, and May 2nd. Each one of Dr. Mann's provocative pronouncements was delivered into a unique set of circumstances. All, however, speak to contentions <clears throat> of the most profound importance for the uh, future of higher education. And what do I mean by that? Among the key principles at issue are the following. What are universities for? Who decides what is to be taught in the curriculum and who is to do the teaching? How is the fragile process of dis distinguishing truth from falsehood best advanced through research, publication, and teaching? Let me just uh, come into the room here. <clears throat> what happens when powerful political lobbies intervene in the process in order to advance self-interested agendas? What are the rules and parameters of the academic requirement that faculty members should perform community service? As I see it, the work that Dr. Barrett and I do, and sometimes with the uh, contributions of Jeremy Roth Cushell, this qualifies as community service appropriate for what a university professor should be doing. Do the protections of academic tenure continue as a baseline of protection for academic freedom? What is the nature of the discourse on tenure in U.S. universities? Why don't our colleagues who are tenured make more proactive use of the protections which we supposedly have to, for instance, go into some depth in the 9-11 issue? Okay, it's fine to condemn the peace movement, condemns uh, wh uh, what happened after 9-11, but what is the substance of 9-11? Who did what to whom? The peace movement is debilitated, I would argue, because there's not a proper analysis. The 9-11 truth movement is the core of the peace movement, and it's become an amazing example of citizens' investigations when governments fail to do their job and present a credible explanation of something really important that happened in our society. Do the protections of academic tenure continue as a baseline of protection for academic freedom? I'll, rep I'll repeat that. Are subjects open to, are all subjects open to academic investigation and debate? Or are some subjects off bounds, subject to censorship and the concerted political cr control of interesting parties? My work on new themes and in new venues of publication and commentary led in the autumn of 2014 to my attendance at the second international New Horizon Con Conference of Independent Thinkers and Filmmakers. At this assembly, I met many investigative journalists whose work I had read and admired, but never actually met. Like for instance, here is Ken O'Keefe, Pepe Escobar, myself and Wayne Madsen, I think these people would be familiar to many people in the room and watching this webcast. Together we address many topics, including 9-11, as well as the negotiations linking Iran's nuclear power facilities with economic sanctions. In this milieu, the intensity of the antagonism between the Israeli government and the government of the Islamic Republic of Iran became very obvious. The gravity of what is transpiring at this high level of global geopolitics engaged me in a way 
that <laughs> spurred me to write many things and to try my hand as a regular commentator on press TV. Part of this antagonism was dramatically illustrated as we left the conference just as Western news media characterized our conference as an Islamic hate fest promoting anti-Semitism and drawing Holocaust deniers and U.S. anti-Israel activists. The main source of this blanket condemnation of our assemblies and discussions was Abraham Foxman, then U.S. National Director of Anti-Defamation League of Bene Brith. Little did I know this term Bene Brith would become so important to me uh, as it is right now. Foxman announced, a disturbing new element in this anti-Jewish gathering is the appearance on the guest list of a few high visibility U.S. anti-war and anti-Israel uh, activists, she ha he had in mind especially Medea Benjamin, who claim their positions are not motivated by anti-Semitism. It will be harder for them to make that claim now, given their open collusion with this event, collusion, and its Iranian government sponsors. I was unsettled to see this kind of, I'm, I'm getting, moving in on the end. <clears throat> I was unsettled to see this kind of generalizing hate speech directed at friends and colleagues who I knew from our discussions harbored diverse opinions on a wide array of topics. Seeing the commentaries of Mr. Foxman and others who followed his lead caused me to reflect in an introspective way on the malicious deployment of the weaponized terms anti-Semite, conspiracy theorist, Holocaust denier, and sometimes 9-11 truther. Apparently to be targeted by any one of these verbal assault weapons is to be placed on the target in the target zone of all of them. It is to be offered up as prey to feed <clears throat> the voracious appetites of imperial aggrandizement. The lethal phrases are often shot off like deadly verbal projectiles with full intention of inflicting professional carnage no gen definitions are generally offered. No proof is required. The phrases are simply invoked as was done against me by Dr. Mon. We'll evacuate the space. Yeah. Okay, Thank you, Tony Hall. Okay. The malicious, the, one, more, one more paragraph here. The, <clears throat> the malicious intent is to down those with the gumption to question the operatives who occupy some of the most powerful centers of power in our times. These power centers include the academy, whose expert practitioners have a crucial role to play in distinguishing truth from falsehood. The evidence is overwhelming that universities are failing quite conspicuously to perform honestly or responsibly or competently even their core civilizational mission. And I'll leave it at that, although that isn't fully the end of the paper. Okay, thank you.